Former Australian opening batsman Arthur Morris here wants to practice driving off the front foot and the bowling machine is perfect for this type of work. The ball lands almost on the same spot every time and in addition to driving, Arthur is able to vary his shot and force the ball away on the onside if he so wishes. My normal stance at the wicket is uh, to have my feet a few inches apart. This enables me to get evenly balanced and I think those players who have their feet together as the bowler is coming up will still have to make a preliminary movement because you've got to get your feet apart anyway before you can start to move into a shot. So you might as well get there in the first place and save that little extra amount of time. It can be clearly seen in the film that my back lift is perhaps not as straight as some other people's and perhaps not as straight as some coaches would advocate. But this has always been my method and, and I do try and get the bat straight as I'm bringing it down to make contact with the ball. That is for shots forward of the wicket and defensive shots. Now you'll notice that the bat is actually lifted and gets up towards the height of the stumps before the bowler lets the ball go. Um, this, I think, is important. If you wait until the bowler lets the ball go, then you will be too late and you'll have to hurry into your shot. Do you think there's much difference in captaincy and field placings these days? I'm told that uh, some of the field placings are more scientific in modern times, although uh, I believe that in the olden days there was more emphasis on the taking of wickets. I don't really think that that's true, Richie. Uh, if anything, I would be inclined to say there's more emphasis on taking wickets today than there used to be. Certainly, anyway, at the start of an innings. Um, you know only too well that we've gone through certain periods in cricket uh, where the laws have been changed. For instance, uh, the law was altered so that you could get a new ball more frequently. And uh, for a while, we were getting a new ball sometimes when there were only 80 or 90 runs on the board. Now, as a result of this, you had your fast bowler and your medium pace bowler being used a lot more. And this developed the habit uh, in, on the part of the captains of starting off with their leg slips and frequently uh, with more slips on the offside and a short gully, nobody back on the fence at third man, nobody on the boundary at fine leg. Now, I think the captains adapt themselves very readily to the rules under which they have to play. But I would certainly think that today, at the start of an innings anyway, there is more emphasis on taking wickets. Um, in any case, uh, at all times, you, you've got to adjust your uh, field placing to the type of bowler who is operating. I think our modern captains are very alive to this. I would think, if anything, their field placing is a little more scientific, and I think they tend also to change their field for each individual batsman a little more than they used to before. As Sir Donald Bradman and all captains know, there is no more important man in the side than the wicketkeeper. Brilliant Australian Wally Grout here shows the technique of stumping as Peter Burge dances down the wicket and plays well away from the ball. Some keepers snatch at the ball, but not Wally. He waits, gloves pointing downwards, for the ball to come to him, and then, like lightning, the bales are removed with the batsman stranded, helpless, yards out of his ground. Standing back to the fast bowlers is important, and the keeper must be able to move either to the off or leg, as Wally Grout does here. Grout and Alan Davidson formed a great combination, and here they trap South African Trevor Goddard with late swing and perfect anticipation. For many years, Barry Jarman has been Grout's understudy, keeping wicket brilliantly, but unable to oust his more experienced teammate from the test team. Jarman is a fine keeper to both fast and slow bowling, and here he gives a lesson in stumping and then points out a fault in many young keepers in that they move too far and are unable to reach the stumps with their initial movement. The same on the leg side. First a perfect stumping and then, as some young keepers do, going too far to take the ball. Now both keepers show their methods of taking the ball on the leg side with a fast bowler operating. First, Grout moves quickly as he sees the ball going wide past the batsman 
and takes it at full stretch with perfect anticipation. Then Jarman, moving in the same way as Grout, finds that he has in fact moved too well and takes the ball inside the line of his body rather than at full stretch. Now, as Neil Hawke scores runs, Jarman combines with one of the greatest of Australia's fieldsmen, Neil Harvey, to demonstrate a run out. Harvey, fielding deep, moves beautifully around the ball as the batsmen take one and turn for a second. His powerful throw flashes to Jarman's gloves with Hawke trying to make his ground. But young cricketers will see how Hawke assists in the run out by not sliding his bat as Jarman whips the bails off. Tom Graveney here finds that Harvey is just as good at slip as in the covers when the brilliant Australian turns the balance of a match at the Sydney Cricket Ground with a great catch. Here's the Harvey method of catching with hands forming an inescapable trap for the ball. Peter Burge snicks the ball well wide of Neil who shows just how the young player should be prepared to dive to make ground and snare the catch. Few who saw it will ever forget this dramatic moment in Test cricket when Neil caught Jim Laker at the Sydney Cricket Ground, knocking the ball up at slip and then again at full stretch and finally taking the catch behind point. One of the greatest all-round fieldsmen since the war was Alan Davidson who always seemed in balance no matter what he was doing in the field. Here the ball is played wide of him at cover but he is still able to gather it in and with a throw against his direction of momentum returns it over the stumps to the waiting wicketkeeper. These players and all other great fieldsmen practiced hard, in the same way as Bob Cowper has shown keeping his reflexes in trim. All test players practice fielding assiduously these days, for who knows what the next ball may bring. It could be the catch that wins or loses the vital test match. To modern day cricketers, fielding and catching is just as important as the batting and bowling spheres of the game. The value of coaching is there for all to see. What about the player, though, with sheer natural ability? Surely it would be dangerous to coach him too much. Oh, yes, it could be. In fact, I would like to emphasise very much indeed this question of intelligence in regard to coaching. Not only as far as the player is concerned, but as far as the coach is concerned. Now, I think it would be fair to say that the greatest players that I have ever seen were players with natural ability who were not coached at all. And if they had been in the hands of an unintelligent, unintelligent coach, they might have been spoilt to some extent. Uh, I'll take my own case as an example. When I first played, it was quite freely said that I would be a failure in England because I hit across the line of flight of the ball. Now, in fact, all I was doing was to play the pull shot from a ball pitched short of a length on the stumps. And there is no other way to play it except by hitting with a cross bat across the line of flight. So you've either got to play it that way or cut the shot out altogether. So the player himself has to learn when he can play it and when he should not play it. But I think that a good coach should spot very quickly a fellow's natural ability and his natural attributes and leave those alone. Just simply develop the things that he's got. And the player in turn must realise that uh, when he's got to have his left elbow up in the air and when he's got to get it out of the road. It's a cooperative effort between the player and the coach. Who are some of the greatest players you've seen over the years? Well, now, if you could spare a couple of hours to sit down by the fireside and talk to me about this, we could have a really good chat, um, because that's a fascinating story. Starting off with some of the Englishmen, I should say uh, Sir Jack Hobbs and Sir Leonard Hutton were certainly two of the greatest, and I refer to them first largely because they were so technically correct. In fact, I think that uh, Sir Jack Hobbs was probably the most correct player that I ever saw. And strangely enough, he was not a coached player. And uh, that, I think, is uh, evidence that you don't have to be incorrect with your technique just because you're not coached. Another great Englishman who was very unorthodox, but a magnificent player, was Dennis Compton. Uh, Wally Hammond, a magnificent batsman, coming to some of our own lads, of course, uh, I think in his 1948 form, Arthur Morris, probably the best left-hander that I saw. Neil Harvey, also very great. Uh, in the bowling line, uh, fellows like Keith Miller, or perhaps I should say all-rounders, fellows like Keith Miller, um, Alan Davidson, I would even like to include you in this category, and uh, 
this was one of the great strengths of Australian cricket in the period when we had these great all-round players. I don't think we have had any bowler as good as Bill O'Reilly. I think he was the greatest I ever saw uh, from any country. Crowley Grimmett, probably the greatest leg spinner of all. And uh, I mustn't forget also that magnificent all-rounder, Ray Lindwell, who was probably the greatest fast bowler that Australia ever had and who was such a magnificent model for the young cricketers with his beautiful, rhythmic, flowing action. I think it would do these young boys good to follow Ray's example in the way he approached the crease and delivered the ball.